good evening. Uh, we want to welcome you to, uh, tonight to our Wednesday night service. Once again, we want to appreciate you for letting us come into your homes uh, via Facebook Live. And uh, I hope you're enjoying these lessons. If you've missed any, they are on, fa uh, on YouTube also. They've been, up they've been uploading them to YouTube. So um, we're, still, uh, we're still talking on the subject, God has never changed his mind about you. You know, so before we get started, um, there's a couple of prayer requests. Uh, we're praying for Brother Ben that uh, he's in the hospital, <coughs> you know, and uh, uh, well, let's just keep him in prayer, you know, that God touch him and heal his body. You know, also uh, we're pr praying for uh, the Vidal family and uh, Randy sang on our praise and worship team, so we are going to be having his memorial service on the 26th of this month, 27th, which is a Saturday. You know, so uh, if you care to join us, you're more than welcome. Um, so, and we're going to go ahead and pray for the tithe and the offerings that have been coming in. Again, uh, we just really want to appreciate you for all your help and your contributions that you do. Uh, to help us keep this ministry going and uh, the word going. Father, we thank you because you're a good God. We thank you because you're awesome. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we stand boldly before you, Lord, and we uh, declare healing in Brother Ben's body in the name of Jesus. Father, your word says by your stripes we are healed. Father, so we stand in agreement with all the prayers that are being made on his behalf. We join our faith and agree that he is well in Jesus' name. Father, we also thank you for the Vidal family. We thank you uh, for all the uh, relatives that you comfort them during this time in Jesus' name. And Father, we just thank you for all the contributors that have been contributing to Fountains of Living Water. Lord, I thank you because you are blessing them. Your blessing is pouring upon them mightily. And we just thank you and we bless you because you will continue to do so in their lives. And we just thank you, Father, because they have more than enough and abundantly to be able to help the furtherance of this gospel that you have charged us to share. And we just thank you for, for them, and we speak a blessing upon them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You want to say something, Dean? Yeah, I'm glad just to be here with you guys. I'm glad to be spreading the word of God with you. I hope that he's showed up in every way possible since we've done this, this lesson as far as knowing that he's not mad. And um, it's a good thing that, you know, we're taking time with this so that you know how much of a loving father he is in every way possible. You know, um, it just, it just amazes me. You know, he shows, he shows his love through my love for my sons of how he feels about me. And I hope you, you get the same thing, whether you're a mom or your dad, where, you know, your love and your loving is unconditional with your kids because it's like the greatest thing that he could ever give us in that facet because he gives you the visual of that where sometimes our kids they can drive us a little crazy you know there's a there's a little little phrase I like to say with my coworkers at work my salesman with, is that and I say it with my kids as well is that I love you sometimes I don't like you when you make me mad but I still love you and I feel like the good Lord is even better than that but if you're in that position where your kid makes you mad, but you still love him, that's that's the visual that he's he wants you to see and, and understand, you know. And you know, we always talk about that he sent his his son to the cross, but the loving aspect of it is the fact that, yeah, he sent his son, but out of love towards you, his unconditional love. Amen. Amen. And um, just to add to what you just said right there, uh, uh, Dean. It wasn't that he sent him. It's that uh, Jesus chose to go. Amen. Yes, he when did. When the Father said, who would go for us? 
He said, send me. Here I am. Send Sign me. Up. Amen. <laughs> you know, so amen. Um, hallelujah. So let's go ahead and read our opening scriptures. The first one is James 1, 16 through 17. It says, do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Ephesians 1, 4 through 6 says, According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved. So again, these two scriptures, we read them in combination because God doesn't change. And he chose to love us from the beginning of the world. Amen. And he hasn't changed his mind. Amen. You know, and uh, people say, well, does God correct sin and the answer is yes but he doesn't do it the way traditional church has taught us he does it through mercy and love you know uh, 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 he does it through through his grace you know so so I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on, on that we I mean because we've been talking about it quite a bit you know uh like I said, you need to go back to YouTube and, and listen to this whole series all over again. It's awesome. You know, just because you heard it once doesn't mean you got it all. Amen. <laughs> you know, so uh, uh, go back and, and, and listen to them. But um, we are, uh, we left off talking the effects of the fall, and we discussed that there were, uh, when Adam fell, he was no longer focused on God, but on himself, because he was naked before the fall, and he was naked after the fall. Before the fall, he was focused on God and didn't know he was naked. After the fall, he's focused on himself, so he's looking how to hide his nakedness, how to hide his shame. You know, and we talked about that people, uh, when they're running from God, they're always seeking to fix and uh, uh, they fix their own wrongs on their own. You know, and, and the thing is, if you could fix yourself, uh, we won't need Jesus. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you know, we gotta come. I, I uh, something Pastor Josh always used to say: God loves you so. He loves you just the way you are. Amen. But he loves you too much to leave you the way you are. Amen. In other words, he doesn't want you to try to change your life. He doesn't want you to try to fix your life. He wants you to come to him so he could change and fix your life. Amen. You know, so, uh, and then we know, we talked about and that the effect of the fall didn't change God's mind. It changed Adam's mind about yeah. God. You know, because now, I mean, if we look at the scriptures, God came in the garden nonchalant like nothing has happened. Did God know Adam had sinned? Yeah, he knew. I mean, he's, he's omniscient. He knows everything. He knew Adam had sinned, but he comes in the garden like nothing has happened, and Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? You know, because he's wanting to come and have that fellow, because his mind hasn't changed about Adam. But what happened? Adam's mind changed because he ran and hid from God. And he tells God, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid. Wait a minute. Before you loved God, now you are afraid of God. You know, and let me say this. If you are afraid of God, then you don't know God. Amen. It's just that simple. If you are afraid of God, then you don't know God. You know, uh, because God should not cause fear in you. If anything, uh, God, uh, God's perfect love will cast all fear out. Amen. 
You know, so, so their thoughts is, uh, I no longer matter to God. I no longer belong to God. I am no longer loved by God. And I, and I am no longer accepted by God. So they became enemies of God in their own mind. You know, it's interesting, this uh, uh, scripture in Colossians, uh, chapter 1, ver uh, verse 21 says, And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies, and I think if you have your Bible open, you should underline that word enemies in your mind. Amen. Not in God's mind, but in your mind. I was enemies to God in my mind. God wasn't holding anything against me. I thought he was holding everything against me, but God was not holding anything against me. So, you see, God has never, it, and, and, and that thought that Abraham, you know, uh, that, excuse me, that Adam thought that God was mad at him, you know, has been passed on through all generations. You know, because we've always, I mean, we ran from God because we thought God was mad at us. You know, uh, uh, and if you stop and think about it, in every instance of, in the Bible, God is always coming out to look for people. Amen. You know, when, uh, when Cain, when Cain, when Cain killed Abel, God came and said, uh, Cain, where's your brother? And he goes, am I my brother's keeper? And God tells him, his blood cries out to me. And, and when Cain finally admits his sin to God, he says, whoa, my sin is great. He goes, and anybody that finds me will surely kill me. The Bible says God put a mark on him, and it says that way everybody will know that you're protected. That mark is not, not of judgment, but it's a mark of protection. Everybody knows if you have that mark, that means God is, uh, is going to protect you because if anybody kills Cain, it says God says, I will avenge you seven times. He still blessed him. I, and I'm not saying murder's okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> by, by, by no means, I'm not saying murder is okay. I, I, hon I honestly believe if you do the crime, you need to do the time. But Pastor, even with that, you know, that's one of your top ten. Mm -hmm. It's your top ten. And even then, too, with the good, you know, our Father in Heaven, that even with that happening, he was, His grace showed up. His grace, His goodness, His love. Amen. You know, uh, again, he's never changed his mind about you. You know, and, and we could go through, uh, through all the Old Testament where that's where we see a lot of, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of judgment. And we could see God always coming to seeking them out first. Amen. He, you know, I always say this, uh, the most, uh, the most rebellious prophet was the one that had the greatest revelation of God's uh, uh, grace and mercy and love. You know, because Jonah, he flat out told God, I ain't going. I'm not going to go. God told him, I want you to go to preach to Nineveh. And he says, no. He said, uh, God says, if you don't uh, go preach to Nineveh and tell them that I, I will destroy them in 40 days. Uh, jo uh, Jonah said, no. God didn't even mention to Jonah, if they repent, I'll forgive them. He said, just go tell them that I'm going to, that in 40 days, I am going to destroy them. And Jonah said, no. And he ran to Tarsus. In chapter 4, verse 1, he tells us why he ran to Tarsus, because when they repented, when they repented, God forgave them and didn't destroy them. And Noah says, tells God, isn't this what I told you when we were uh, in, uh, uh, in my hometown and you told me to come preach to them? Isn't this what I was telling you, that you were loving and forgiving and merciful? 
And if they repent, you would forgive them? And that's why I fled and went to Tarsus? Yeah, I mean, he was upset. You know, because he knew. He says, he goes, I know you, God. You're talking destruction right now, but the moment they say, I repent, you're loving and kind and quick to forgive. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I always say, uh, uh, the prophet, the, re, the most rebellious prophet had the greatest revelation of God's love and mercy. Amen. You know, because he, and, and, and this is the thing, Jonah preached three days. You know how long it took to walk Nineveh? How long? Three days. From one end to the other, it will take you three days to, uh, to get across Nineveh on foot. So basically, he's walking, yelling, repent, uh, because, not repent, God said that he will, he's going to, because of your iniquity and your sin, God is going to destroy you in 40 days. And he's going down. In other words, he just made sure everybody heard the message one time. You know, because uh, he figured the less, I mean, uh, evangelists today would have preached the whole 40 days. You know, but he preached the least. All it, all, as long, uh, just what it would take me to get across town and know that everybody heard the message one time. And the king proclaimed a fast and repentance, and God forgave them. Good preaching. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Amen. You know, uh, he has never changed his mind. Never. And I always look at this. Why, when I, when I read the Old Testament, you know, uh, yes, you see a lot of destruction, but count how many times God always sent the prophet to warn them that way they would repent and that judgment would not come upon them. You know, so anyway, this last part, God has never changed his mind about you. There's a story, Dean, you know, in the Old Testament that I think uh, is a good type of what we're talking about. And that's the so a story of uh, the house of Saul and the house of David. In 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, but David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. And right now my eyes aren't helping me because I got my glasses and I can't see those letters up there. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I know that's a better version because that's a new King James and mine's is old King James. You know, so, so I want you to notice that, that there's a war. But the war is really not on David's, on David's side. It says, because uh, 2 Samuel 4, 4 says, And Jonathan, Saul, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet he was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of uh, Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it came to pass as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. You know, so in other words, these two houses, the house of David and the house of Saul, were at war, but it really it wasn't it wasn't David's house that was at war. David had opportunities to kill Saul, and refused to do. He had two opportunities to kill Saul, and he re he refused to do it. You know, uh, he said, "God forbid that I lay my hands on the anointed." You know, so David was not at war with Saul. Saul was at war with David, but David was not at war. With, uh, with Saul. So when the news came that, that uh, Jonathan and Saul 
which were uh, Saul was the king of Israel and Jonathan was the heir to the throne. When the news came that they were dead, in, in, in the minds of uh, King Saul's family, it says, okay, we're lost. We're doomed. They were our only hope. They were our, our only strength. David's house was getting stronger. For sure, now he's going to come and he's going to kill us all. And they all fled and ran and hid. And this is where Mephibosheth comes in. You know, but listen to David's heart. And David said, is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show kindness for him, for, uh, for Jonathan, Jonathan's sake? In other words, they're running because they think David is out to kill him. And in David's heart, he's, he's saying, is there anybody left that I could be kind to? Is there anybody left in their family that I could show mercy to? He's chasing them to be good to them. He's, uh, he's seeking them out to be good to them, but in their mind, they're running from him because they think he's out to kill them. That sounds like the children of Israel. God came to Egypt to deliver them, and through the whole trip, I mean, stop and think about this. Through the whole trip, every time they would, uh, they would meet up with a, with a uh, difficult situation, their first thing was, did you, bring, uh, did you bring us out here to kill us? They're all thinking that, about that. That would be like me and you going on a road trip. And every time we make a, a, a stop, are you going to leave me here? Are you going to kill me here? <laughs> You know, no, Dean, uh, we're going to gas up and eat something. And then we get up and go in and we stop somewhere. Else. Is this where you're going to kill me? Is this where I'm going to die? Is this where you're going to leave me behind? You know, I'm going to get the idea that you think I'm trying to hurt you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so uh, David is seeking them out to be kind to them. But they're running thinking that he's mad at them. And isn't that just the way it is? Pastor, along with that, in David's lineage of his, of his family, who is of that? Showing, showing mercy and goodness and kindness. Mm -hmm. who, is, who is in David's lineage? Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. The seed's but, there. The seed's there. And, and that, that's why I'm saying that this story is very much related to what we're talking about. Because guess what? God is seeking us out. Amen. And we think he's seeking us out to judge us and punish us. And he's seeking us out to be kind. Amen. He's seeking you out to show you his love and his mercy and his kindness to you. Amen. You know, I mean, uh, he's going through and for the earth seeking you to be kind to you. You know, so, so to me, I mean, th uh, this is an awesome, awesome, awesome story. You know, uh, I want you to see this. God was not mad at Adam and Eve when they disobeyed. It says, and the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou were naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? In other words, who told you this? And stop and think about it. It's not in the Bible, but because... Uh, in my dealings with the devil and guilt, you know, the devil and, and, and talking to people, every time you, uh, you make a mistake is, well, you can't go to church. Look at what you did last night. You can't go to church. And a lot of times that starts the, the I'll clean myself up before I get to church mentality, Pastor. Uh, what we were talking you, we try to fix ourselves 
before we come to church. Amen. You know, and God don't want you to fix yourself. God wants you to come just as you are so he can fix you. Amen. You know, you know, uh, 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 but so I could hear uh, what I was saying. So I could hear the devil telling, telling Adam and Eve, oh, God's here. You can't go before him naked. He's going to be mad at you. He stirred up the lie, you know, Pastor. And you know what came to mind about that is that somehow, some way, and this is not in the Bible, but the, the devil was an angel. And I'm sure in his time that he's seen his love. Hence, it starts the lie of you. He wants you. He wants to lie to you, thinking you have to fix yourself, knowing that if you go back to to God, that He'll love you anyway. And and like I said, that's not in the Bible, but I'm sure somehow, some way, that's probably what stir, starts that lie, because it is a lie. Mm-hmm. You you know when you you're sitting there and you're like, I, well, God see, doesn't want you that way. Well, you know? see that, that's. That's 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 iniquity right there. That's what we've been talking that iniquity is. Amen. Iniquity is that you try to imitate and uh, and uh, uh, imitate God's life, independent from God, and thinking that you'll get the same results. Amen. You know, uh, uh, you cannot. It doesn't matter how close you get to to imitating God. If it's if it's your doing, you're under law. Amen. You know, uh, and, and, and that's where it, it stems from. You know, you trying to fix yourself is 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 the uh, the thought that Satan planted that you could be like God without God. I mean, and that's the thought he had. You know, he said, I will go through the sky, I will go through the stars, I will put my throne on the most, uh, on the side of the north, and then he says, and I will be like the most high. In other words, he's trying to be like God, independent from God. You know, so when you're trying to fix yourself, you're trying to be like God, independent from God. Amen. And that's, not, that's never going to work. You know, so... Uh, I want you to notice that it says uh, God knew they had e- eaten and and acted like he didn't. But see, from the foundation of the world, God had decided that man would be holy and without blame. Amen. Because that's what our first scripture says. It says in Ephesians, according as he has chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him and love. In other words, he determined from the foundation of the world that we would be holy and without blame. You know, so, so uh, uh, this is a determination that, that he made. You see, what does it take to become holy and without blame? All you have to do is accept Jesus. That's simple. Amen. That's simple. And once you accept Jesus, you have his life is attributed to you. And you stand before God with the life of Jesus being attributed to you. I stand before God with his life, with the life of Jesus being attributed to me. You know, I'm not a perfect man. And I always say this jokingly, you know, my only imperfection is uh, I have to admit that I'm not perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, we're not perfect people. I mean, if, if, if anybody could uns- take the stop off and look at every thought that crosses our mind, you know, oh, you know, we don't take those thoughts to action, but a lot of thoughts cross our mind. We're Amen. not perfect people. But I don't stand before God in, in, in my goodness. I don't stand before God in what I can do. I stand before God in, in the life of Jesus. Amen. Because I have accepted him into my heart. His life now is attributed to me. His obedience is attributed to me. My, my, my disobedience, and that's scripture, that's not, that's not uh, 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 speculation. My disobedience 
was attributed to Jesus so that his obedience would be attributed to me, so that I would be holy and without blame. Amen. You know, and uh, if you're wondering where that's at, that's in uh, Romans 5.19. You know, so, so uh, uh, I want you to see this, that God did not curse Adam and Eve. He told them the consequences. And this is something that you need to understand, that sin has consequences. It's not God's judgment or God's punishment. It is the consequences of sin. Listen, if you plant a tumbleweed, you're not going to get a beautiful rose. <laughs> no, you're not. If you plant sin, you're going to reap the consequences of sin. You know, so God is not cursing Adam and Eve. Now, he did curse two things, but Adam and Eve were, were not in there. I want you to see this in Genesis 3, 13 and 17. It says, And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed. He's cursing the serpent. Amen. Above all cattle and about every beast of the field, upon your belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Notice what he says unto the woman. And that's a whole sermon right there, but that, because that scripture is awesome right there. Amen. But without getting off the subject, listen to what he tells the woman. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply the sorrows of thy conception, in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. He's giving her the consequences. This is the consequences. Your childbearing pains are going to multiply. You know, so that means she was going to feel a little discomfort giving birth, but now it's going to be a lot worse. And then, you know, I, I read the scripture in a, in in a, in a, in a, in a, another version that says, um, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over you. One version said it this way, uh, and you will try to please your husband, and he will take advantage of you. You know, uh, because of her guilt of what she did, she's now trying to make up, and guess what? Men are taking advantage of it. That's, that's, the, that's, that's not a curse. That's the consequences of sin. You, you know, and godly men should not be taking advantage of their wives. Amen. You know, now listen to this. And unto Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of which I command thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground. Did not he curse Adam. Adam? Not Adam. Cursed is the ground. So he didn't curse Eve and Adam, but he did curse the serpent and he did curse the ground. Why? Because he didn't change his mind about Adam and Eve. Hallelujah. He said, you're still my creation. I'm still, in my mind, this is God, in my mind, I still see you because I've determined from the foundation of the world, before I created anything, I determined, Adam, that you and Eve were going to be holy and without blame. Amen. You know, I'll curse the serpent, I'll curse the ground. I can't curse you. I mean, uh, I like the scripture in Numbers 23, 19, and 20. It says, God is not man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Has he said and shall he not do it? 
Has he spoken and shall he not make it good? Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. Hallelujah. In other words, God saying, I'm not going to, I've determined to bless man. And in this scripture, it's talking about the children of Israel. But this gives us a picture of God's mind. When I determine to bless something and I determine to bless man, I'm not going to change my mind about it. I'm not, there's nothing that's going to cause me to think differently. And I like, to, behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he has blessed. Woo, hallelujah. Amen. And I cannot reverse it. I like uh, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Lamentations 3:22 through 23, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassion fails not. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Amen. Malachi 3:6. For I am the Lord, I change not. And that's why you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Amen. You know, so this is kind of, hey, I've never changed my mind about you. Now, this is what I want you to see. It says, let no man say in James chapter 1 verse 13, James chapter 1, verse 13 through 18, it says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Now, uh, when I made these notes, uh, God hadn't showed me this, but something that God showed me was in, um, I believe it's in uh, De Deuteronomy uh, 30.19. It says, I call heaven and earth to record this day that I have placed life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life so that you may live. And something the Lord spoke to me, it says, life goes with blessing. They're one and the same. If you choose life, you've chosen blessing because they're one and the same. Death goes with cursing. So if you choose death, you're cursed. So we can read it this way. Then when lust has conceived and it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth curse. Brings forth death, because they're one and the same. Death and curse. So all you have to do is read that uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 15 through the end of the chapter, and you find all the curse. That's death. That curse that's in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 28, verse 15 through the end of the chapter, that's, that's the curse, and that's a description of what death is. You know, so, so listen... Then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth curse, brings forth death. And then it says, we've been reading this uh, for the past uh, four or five weeks as our opening scripture, do not err, my beloved brethren. Why? The mistake we make is that when the curse starts coming upon us, we think, why is God judging me? Why is God punishing me? And it is not God's judgment. It is not God's punishment. It's be the consequences of sin. See, so even though I preach a lot on God's love and mercy, I don't deny the fact that there is consequences to sin. You know, and when we persist on it, the curse, the consequences of it are going to come upon me. Not because God wants them to. Because listen, 
Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turnings. In other words, he's saying, I'm never going to change my mind about you. And that's where a lot of folks, pastors, they get, they get stuck on that. But as they're dealing with the fruits of the sin, they need to come back and remind themselves, remind yourselves that God still loves you. Mm -hmm. And that's where, that's where, you know, the story stops. It's because the fact is that you get, you get stuck and you're like, this is, this is the fruit of the sin, the consequences, the pastor says. You're there and, you know, you sold seed, so there it is. But in essence, too, though, you need to remind yourself of the other scriptures. And these, these scriptures are awesome for what we covered to begin with. There's one to start your day of what we just covered as far as start your day with the thoughts of God. God thinks of good things towards you. Your sin, yes, there's still fruit there. But God's walking around still saying, there's my boy, and I still love him. There's my girl. I still love her. And, and, and the thing is that, you, that when you begin to acknowledge that, he begins to pull those, those, those uh, thorn bushes that you planted out so Amen. that you could be blessed. <laughs> Amen. You know, I, I like this Isaiah 30, 18. It says, and this is in the Amplified. It says, there, and therefore the Lord earnestly waits, expecting, looking, and longing to be gracious to you. Hallelujah. And therefore he lifts himself up that he may have mercy on you and show loving kindness to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed, happy, fortunate, to be envied are all those who earnestly wait for him, who expect and look and long for him, for his victory, his favor, his love, his peace, his joy, and his matchless Unbroken companionship. Amen. I like that last last word, companionship. He's still with you. Amen. 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 And uh, uh, the first part is so beautiful. And therefore the Lord earnestly waits, expecting, looking, and longing to be gracious to you. To be gracious to you. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I could do me a little jig right here. You should see his jig. <laughs> <laughs> and, and because my, God is earnestly looking to be gracious to me. I, I like that word there, longing. Longing is just, he wants to do it. You know, he's on the prosperity part. He's got his wall. He's holding his wallet and saying, I want to pay the bill. I want to get that for you. I, I want to get that to you. Longing is just so much that it's 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 a... It's an emotion of not just doing it, but wanting with such compassion. And, and that, to me, that's just an amazing part because it just shows how much he feels towards us. Amen? Amen? To conclude, Dean, I, I like this conclusion I wrote. It says, if my wife begins to doubt that I love her, if I go buy her an expensive gift, that gift is not to help me change my mind into loving her. But it is so that it could remove all doubt in her that she could believe that I do love her. Amen. In the same manner, the cross is not meant whereby God changes his mind towards us and begins to love us. The cross is so that our minds could be changed and we can believe God loves us. Amen. So the cross is not to change God's mind, but to change my mind. But God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you because you're awesome. Whew. Father, I ask that if anybody is out there that does not know this awesome love that you have for them, that they may come to know you, the only true God, and that you have loved them from their very beginning 
and you have never stopped loving them. Father, I ask that right there where they're at, that your Holy Spirit just begins to embrace them. And they could begin to sense your loving kindness coming upon them in Jesus' name. Now, if you're out there and you've never accepted Jesus as Lord, all you have to do is say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And when you do that, when you do that, because the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. When you do that, you're born again, and you're on your way to heaven. So just go ahead and say it. Amen? And let us know about it, and come visit us at church. We are open on Sunday mornings. Our address is 518 uh, East 2nd Street here in Casa Grande. We'd like to see you, and we'd like to hear from you. Amen? Dean, you have something to, you want to say to close? This this whole lesson that we've learned, that we go over, I hope that, you know, it touched you and, and look into it as far as what, how God feels about you. You know, uh, my favorite story is the prodigal son because the fact is that it, it shows how a picture of God running towards you. And see that tonight. See that, that for all that you've been through that, he's, he's seen you from afar, as the scripture says, and he came, he runs to you. And he's running to you right now, that, that person out there that just keeps on trying to figure out things, trying to do things on your own. You know, just stop. Stop right there. Stop your friend that's maybe even that. Spread that word. Just telling him, listen, he's going out looking for you. He's, he's here looking for you right now. And that with that in mind, that it's, it's an act of love. And know that it is just that love. We love you guys. Please, please. Focus on that God's love because when you do, your life will change. Amen. Amen. That's all I got for tonight, Pastor. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, we love you guys. Good night, and we'll see you Sunday. Don't forget that uh, we are having a conference uh, this Saturday for Organizational Leadership uh, Conference, and uh, it's going to start at 10 a.m., and we're going to be ending at 6 p.m., so... Uh, if you feel a little tugged to come spend the day with us here, uh, Saturday morning, uh, you are invited. Amen. Have a good night.